Hello, everyone, and welcome to Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Kraus, and in this episode covering the great books of Western literature, we continue our exploration of Cicero's great work, The Republic. Cicero's political philosophy is the most comprehensive from among all the Roman philosophers. In fact, we owe much to Cicero, since he was the one who translated Politeia as Republic with regards to Plato, hence forever passing on Plato's great work to us as the Republic, and thus Cicero paid homage to Plato through his work De Re Publica, and in his Republic, Cicero famously charts out the three forms of government and the cycles of constitutions in building from Plato's arguments. In this episode, we will cover the three forms of government and the cycles of constitutions according to Cicero. Like Aristotle, Cicero sees three natural, simple forms of government, monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. Cicero does not see democracy as the devolved or perverted form of constitutionalism as does Aristotle or even Plato. In fact, Cicero doesn't really see these three forms of having a perverse form per Aristotle. Instead, he just sees these three forms of government as having pros and cons that plague each. But all three have positives and negatives, and he outlines them toward the end of Book 1. In terms of pure theory, Cicero agrees with Aristotle that democracy or constitutional government is best on paper. Like Aristotle, if we understand Cicero's democracy as akin to Aristotle's constitutionalism, Cicero states that of the three ideal forms of government, democracy would be the best. The nature of every state depends on the character and will of its ruling body, Cicero writes. So liberty has no home in any state except a democracy. Nothing can be sweeter than liberty. Cicero acknowledges that political liberty is the greatest good to be had in politics, since liberty itself is the gateway to truth, beauty, and happiness. He then says, Yet if... It isn't equal throughout. It isn't liberty at all. Thus, liberty is definitionally egalitarian, and there is no conflict, per contemporary libertarians of the American style, of the zero-sum game between liberty and equality. Cicero sees the two as tied together, two sides of the same coin, as it were. One cannot have more liberty than another, and claim to be a society that values liberty itself. If liberty is value, it must be shared equally with everyone. This is what democracy, on paper, claims to stand for. Another benefit of democracy is that it is predicated on universal merit. Anyone can rise to the top if they are industrious, intelligent, virtuous, and hardworking. No consideration of wealth, family lineage, or filial honor is taken into consideration. Though we have limited writings from Cicero on the topic due to missing pages, his argument here is rather simple. Democracy is not merely the rule of the people. It is the universal enshrinement of liberty and merit. It is free and open to all, and anyone can rise to the top through their own hard work and talent. Democracy functions on equality, and equality is the proper understanding of liberty. But if you think Cicero is going to choose democracy as his preferred choice of government, you'd be wrong. This is a purely hypothetical defense of ideal democracy. Real life is a problem. In democracy, however, the common good, common cause, and common sacrifice that unite people together is the cause of egalitarian liberty. This is the glue which makes a democracy a republic, the public thing. We all have a common good, common cause, and common sacrifice in defense of liberty and merit. We must remember that in ancient political thought, a republic is simply that, the public thing that unites all. 
A republic can exist within a monarchy, an aristocracy, or a democracy. They're not mutually exclusive as moderns tend to think. But Cicero's democratic republic is not an atomized and individualistic democracy. It is a democracy that is communitarian, inculcates social relationships, and creates a spirit of sacrifice for others. For without this social dynamic, as we also covered in our first lecture covering human nature and politics in Cicero's Republic, it cannot, by definition, be the public thing. Additionally, when Cicero writes about the pros, the benefits, of democracy on paper, we must never forget Cicero's own lineage and why he views democracy, especially merit, so positively. Cicero was not from among the aristocratic class. He was a new man, a novus homo, who had risen through the Roman ranks to achieve his status in society. Cicero, of course, would privilege any society, any government on paper, which valued merit because Cicero himself was a beneficiary of merit. Moving on to the benefits of aristocracy, Cicero claims that aristocracy is the result of the despotism that befalls a democracy. People turn to the best men of society, the aristocrats, for the purpose of reimposing order and security because democracy, quote, has been ruined by people who cannot think straight, end quote. This issue of education and philosophy to politics is addressed throughout Cicero's book, esoteric mostly in book one, but more explicitly so in the later books, especially books three and four, and we will have a lecture covering politics, education, and humanism in Cicero's Republic. According to Cicero, aristocracy is the most moderate form of government. It sits between the tyranny of absolutism, monarchy, the rule of one, and the reckless chaos of the mobs, devolved democracy. Cicero writes, Hence the aristocrats have taken over the middle ground between the inadequate autocrat and the reckless mob. Nothing could be more moderate than that. With such men protecting the state, the people must be very fortunate. They are freed from all the trouble and anxiety, having made others responsible for their carefree life. This statement is interesting because Cicero, following Plato, asserts that the mobs are feckless and do not actually care about liberty. They care about nihilistic hedonism instead, and they wrap it in the banner of liberty and equality, and therefore move democracy into tyranny. They do not want to take responsibility for their life. They don't want to take responsibility living in their community, their actions, so they push it off to others. The question becomes, do we have a legitimate reason to complain when tyranny, in its aristocratic form, rears its ugly head? For Cicero, aristocracy, aristocracy's benefits are that it allows people to live their feckless and carefree lives with some resemblance of law and order, assuming the mobs aren't toppling the aristocratic state. That aristocracy is orderly and stable, and that it usually does offer, for the time being at least, the prudence of the rule of the best men in society. All of these things are to, to an aristocracy's benefit. Stability, order, the rule of law, the ability to allow us to live our own lives as we wish. The purpose of aristocracy, as rule of best men, is to maintain order and moderation in political society. You can hear echoes of Aristotle here. The golden mean, moderation, law, and order. As Cicero stated, no other form of government is more moderate than an aristocracy, and moderation is always a good thing. What makes an aristocracy a republic is that the public is invested in the common good, the common cause, and the common sacrifice of moderated stability and order. Here, the republic changes from democracy in an aristocracy. The common good, the common cause, the common sacrifice that allows a republic to exist in democracy is liberty 
and merit. In an aristocracy, the public thing is invested in moderated order and stability. These manifest itself in the rule of the best men, the aristocrats. In short, an aristocratic republic values order and stability from which the fruits of liberty and merit can be enjoyed. For Cicero, monarchy is, in fact, the best of the three simple forms of government, even if it is not the most ideal. After all, Cicero claims that democracy in an ideal world would be best, but the ideal world does not exist. In the real world, monarchy suffices. It is, before Cicero, it is here that Cicero defends monarchy when he states, I prefer a mixture of all three, with, however, a caveat to monarchy. When he is pushed to the limits, Ciceronian realism takes precedence in the form of Scipio when he says that ultimately monarchy, if we had to choose between the simple three, would be the one he chooses. But of course, Cicero, through Scipio, can also claim that we would prefer a mixture of the three. The benefits of monarchy, properly speaking, is that it is reflective of filial foundationalism and beauty. Like Aristotle, Cicero considers the family household as the basis of all civilization and politics. The name of king is like that of a father, in that a king takes thought for his subjects as if they were his children and looks after them more conscientiously than others, Cicero writes. Thus the king is like the household father, and his subjects are his children. A good father loves his children and only wants the best for them. So he provides the best for them and nurtures them to be an honorable and virtuous people as they grow older. Furthermore, Cicero discusses the attraction to monarchy because we have an inherent want for beauty. And there is nothing more beautiful than the ritualism, symbolism, and the allegory of monarchy. Accordingly, Cicero writes, kings attract us by affection, aristocracy by good sense, and democracies by freedom. So in comparing them, it is hard to choose which one likes best. But Cicero has a clear preference towards monarchy by listing it first. We are social animals, as we've discussed before, and we desire love and beauty. This comes out most explicitly in a monarchy. Cicero even pivots the discussion to nature itself, human nature, and why it is conducive to monarchy. Yet in this discussion of ours, we are not concerned with nationality, but with nature. If sensible men, not very long ago, wanted to have kings, then my witnesses are not so very ancient, nor are they wild and uncivilized, Cicero tells us through the persona of Scipio in a dialogue. What is meant here is simply this. Monarchy has been the most common and natural form of government throughout human history. It attracts us by affection, by our love, our want for beauty and belonging. It deeply embodies the realities of human nature, wisdom, and desire all at once. Monarchy attracts us by its very nature because we share the nature of what monarchy symbolizes. Beauty, compassion, fatherliness, or motherliness with a queen, filialism, and the general dispositions of human affection and attraction. Thus, monarchy allows us to participate with and installs us with deep reverence for beauty, family, traditions, and closest and it, close, it is the closest reflection of an orderly hierarchical world, which of course Cicero believes to be the nature of the world we live in. Monarchy as republic is tied to the common cause, common good, and common sacrifice of filial affection and the desire for beauty. Why then is monarchy the most preferred form of government for Cicero if he had to choose just one? 
It is because monarchy is the closest to the simplest realities of human nature. Filialism, affection for beauty, the desire to belong to something. One lays down his life for his father, his fatherland, so that others may enjoy the fruits of nurturing health. Monarchy demands a common virtue found in common affection, which is the nearest reality to human nature and the closer reality to human nature than stability and order, as we found in aristocracy, and liberty and merit, as we found in democracy. Cicero, again, thinks that monarchy tugs at the heart of human nature most profoundly because humans have an innate nature which seeks the beautiful, the filial, and the affectionate, which is what monarchy is supposed to embody. And since we all, as humans, share this nature, that is why a monarchy can be a public thing and why a republic can exist in a monarchy. So to summarize very quickly, Cicero, while he thinks democracy is the best in ideal form and on paper, the pros of democracy is that it offers liberty and merit to all, and that is the basis on which the republic stands in a democracy. In an aristocracy, moderation, stability, and order are what are most prized in that form of government, and the republic exists in our mutual desire and want to have stability and order and moderation so we can live our lives free of chaos and mob rule. In a monarchy, the common values and virtue that make it a republic are in its beauty, its filial attraction, and the affections of the human heart, the closest manifestation of the social nature within us all. What follows from Cicero's defense of the three forms of government is one of the most remarkable analyses of the history of politics and constitutional evolution or devolution in ancient history and political philosophy. Cicero basically argues that politics is the constant devolution of political order into tyranny. One can see the echoes of Plato here. Monarchy starts first. Eventually, one king or queen is terribly unjust and cruel. The aristocrats rise in their mutual power and overthrow the monarch. A new constitution is established, proclaiming the rule of the aristocrats. Eventually, the aristocrats become oligarchs and tyrants themselves. The masses then rise up and form a democracy in its place. Claiming liberty, equality, and merit, the revolution is successful. That said, democracy quickly descends into anarchy, by which large segments lift up strong men to restore order, as the people want to return to their sensual and frivolous, feckless lives. This is the push back to aristocracy, a moderated order that takes the best that democracy offered, liberty, the best that aristocracy offers, stability, the rule of the best, and, in fact, the best of monarchy, the affection for some sort of social order. Eventually, the aristocrats then become self-obsessed and cruel, giving way to Caesarism and the restoration of monarchy as a single fatherly figure arises and wins the adoration and praise of the masses, whereby he overthrows the aristocracy. This cycle of monarchy to aristocracy to democracy, democracy to aristocracy to monarchy, repeats itself and continues without end. As mentioned, Cicero prefers, of course, a mixture of all three forms of government. A mixture is better able to safeguard against all the problems that come with three simple forms. Cicero's commentary on the nature of cyclical constitution, evolution, and devolution is very thought-provoking, since, of course, we might see that it has much resonance today. 
The drive to democracy is the push for greater liberty and equality and merit. But once this is achieved, the people grow weak and licentious with their wealth and prostitute their liberty and equality away in favor of hedonism and nihilism, from which chaos and anarchy emerges because of the lack of wisdom and virtue from among the population. The return to order commences and the cycle starts anew, moving from democracy to aristocracy back to monarchy, as we've just explained. And then, of course, it goes from monarchy back to aristocracy to democracy and so on and so forth. According to Cicero, not even a mixed constitution can prevent this movement of human history and politics. Although a mixed constitution has the most built-in mechanisms to prevent the descent into tyranny as it, calls, as it calls us to defend it by filial virtue and affection, the monarchical aspects of a mixed constitution, through the promise of order, stability, and the rule of the best men, the aristocratic aspects of the mixed government, who seek to guarantee and uphold liberty, equality, and merit, the democratic aspects in a mixed government, only an educated, virtuous, and courageous people can prevent the slip into tyranny and anarchy. And this struggle for virtue is why philosophy is important to society. It buttresses against Caesarism and against nihilistic hedonism. Again, we cannot divor divorce the historical reality away from Roman Stoics, especially Cicero, and their obvious political goals of wanting to save the Roman Republic regardless of whether it was worth saving. Cicero, Seneca, Cato certainly thought so. But Cicero argues that the growth of constitutions and constitutional rights is the result of the flight from tyranny, which produces a new constitution, which nevertheless fails and dissolves into tyranny at a future point in time when people have lost their virtue. On this note, Cicero sees history and politics as cyclical, but essentially political in nature. The human being is tied to the political world, as should be clear from our social animus and following Aristotle's dictum that the state is the highest reflection and manifestation of the social animus and of human nature, and that we cannot escape that reality in history and society. History, then, is the tragic story of the decline and fall of political orders and their constitutions of the story of virtuous people collapsing into their common virtue and foregoing the responsibilities necessary for preserving the Republic. They give themselves over to nihilism, which always leads to tyranny. When people get upset with tyranny, they eventually revolt and the constitutions change to reflecting the newfound revolution. However, all people grow weak in their virtue and again renege on the constitutional compact that was birthed from revolution and they fall prey to tyranny once again. At this point, they rise for a restoration of peace and order and the cycles of constitutional change and political change continue like clockwork. Again, it is obvious from Cicero's own historical situation that he feels like this is what the Roman Republic is experiencing. The march to Caesarism is coming, and he has more than just mere thoughts to express on this subject. Yet Cicero is no historicist. History is not the unfolding to any grand consummation, because history cannot have a teleology, as it is not something with nature, like humans, However, history is implicated by the ebb and flow of humans either embracing their nature, the call to excellence, which leads to an excellent form of politics, or the rejection of their nature, which is the plight downward to hedonism, nihilism, and eventually tyranny. That said, Cicero is offering up an early account of a philosophy of history that is 100% tied to his philosophy of politics. Certainly many people today might find resonance with Cicero on these points. Moving away from the pros of the three forms of government and the constitutional cycles as Cicero sees it, we now turn to what he sees as the problems of democracy, aristocracy, and monarchy. 
Democracy suffers from two or possibly three major problems. Three if you count the third separate from the second. Two if you consider the third problem contingently related to the second issue. According to Cicero, wealth is ironically a major problem for democracy. Democracy is premised on equality. Too much wealth becomes an obvious problem unless it is distributed justly. But even when it is, the faint-hearted and the weak give way and succumb to the haughtiness of wealth. Basically, people become so obsessed with wealth that they do not care for liberty, even equality, certainly not merit. All they care about is wealth, and that is the major problem in a democracy. As Cicero later says, the destruction of democracy into tyranny is a direct result of over-commercialization, the pursuit of wealth, and the destruction of the natural land that was required in the pursuit of wealth. As he writes, As the death of aristocracy comes from its own excessive power, so freedom plunges an over-free populace into slavery. All excess, whether the over-luxuriance has occurred in the land or in the people's bodies, this turns them into unvirtuous individuals. In other words, extreme freedom pr produces a tyrant because extreme freedom demands no virtue. It is hedonism writ large, where one just prostrates their body to the endless pursuit of fleeting bodily pleasure. This is what follows, according to Cicero, when we give ourselves over to money and to wealth. The second problem in a democracy is the lack of educated people. The commoners are, overall, simply put, dumb. Let's not sugarcoat the fact that this is Cicero's view of the plebeians. They're not intelligent and thoughtful people. They give themselves over to their passions, which is why they renege on freedom, which demands virtue, wisdom, and knowledge, and decide to prostitute and weather their bodies giving themselves completely over to the desires of their passions while pushing off responsibility to others, thus giving rise to aristocracy or monarchy to bear their irresponsible lifestyle. The exhaustion of this is, of course, the descent into chaotic anarchy. From this lack of education flow the collapse of virtue, since virtue demands moderation and the control of one's passions and emotions. Again, Cicero and the Stoics see the two as linked, though as you can see, these are potentially two separate issues. But as Cicero says, too many people now, in their folly, want to get rid of an admirable system. They advocate a new distribution of wealth through some resolution of the plebes, whereby senators would have to resign their equestrian status. In other words, the collapse of education leads to a collapse in virtue, which leads to a collapse of an orderly, admirable, and virtuous body politic. Just like with Plato, Cicero sees the mob as a danger, not only to themselves, but to the preciousness of liberty and the admirable systems that have emerged to buttress against too much haughtiness, hedonism, and nihilism. Democracy, theoretically, as Cicero previously said, would be the best form of all political governance. Human nature and reality, however, get in the way of this. Anyone who says otherwise is simply an ignorant fool, captivated by his own delusional folly. From the folly flows the danger of youth, arrogance, and vulgarity. This is the third potential problem in a democracy, or again, just attached to the problems of lack of education. Cicero, Cicero writes, Youngsters assume the authority of older men. The latter lower themselves to take part in the youngsters' amusement for fear of becoming unpopular and disliked. As a result, even slaves behave with excessive freedom. Wives enjoy the same rights as their husbands, and in this all-pervading freedom, dogs and horses and even asses charge around so freely that one has to stand aside for them in the street. 
Lack of wisdom, virtue, and moderation, which stems from ignorance and poor education, leads to chaos. Young men fancy themselves as the arbiters of knowledge and wisdom. Those stupid old people, in our own words for today, would be a problem, according to Cicero. Cicero doesn't cut the elderly generation any slack, however. While he condemns the arrogance and the vulgarity of youth, he also explains that the elderly are to have their share of the problems for allowing the young, the arrogant, and the haughty, and the vulgar, for seizing the reins of society. This is the man-child phenomenon of today. Older people who don't want to grow up and take responsibility, they would rather fit in with the times and with the youngsters. They, they ride the waves of young populism to be accepted by the Ciceronian equivalent of Plato's cave society, rather than defend the good, the true, and the beautiful. It is the complete collapse of an orderly harmony because ignorant people fancy themselves as intelligent and the elderly generations, for fear of being shamed and attacked by the younger generations, prostitute themselves to the passions of, of, the, passions of the idiocy of the young. Essentially, Cicero describes what sociologists call the arrogance of youth. People who are dumb but think they're smart despite not having done anything serious in their own life. They just like to hear themselves talk and think that they can solve all the problems that older people have been unable to resolve. The result of this perpetual mistrust, as Cicero states, fathers distrust sons, sons distrust fathers, people across all the strata of society distrust one another, distrust runs amok in society, and this causes the breakdown of all political order. For Cicero, Democracy, while best on paper, is the hardest form of government to maintain for the reasons just stipulated. That said, we must never forget that on paper, Cicero does think democracy would be the best form if only the best aspects of democracy would exist forever. Aristocracy, of course, is also not without its problems. For Cicero, the obvious problem with aristocracy is the temptation that aristocrats have to further their own power. Like with democracy, the temptations tend to be material goods and wealth, as Cicero writes. When, as a result of vulgar misconception, a few with money, not worth, have gained control of the state, this is the problem of an aristocracy. Basically, aristocracy is the conflict between virtuous, noble, and honorable best men who serve the interests of the common good versus those aristocrats who care not for honor, for worth, and virtue, and give themselves over to the pursuit of material goods, wealth, and power. Money, name, and property, if divorced from the good sense and skill in living one's own life, and directing the lives of others, lapse into total degradation and insolence, Cicero writes. Servants of greed degenerate arist aristocracy into an oligarchic tyranny. Another way of looking at the problem of aristocracy is this. Men are tempted by their passions, just like the mob. Aristocrats, however, have the time and ability to devote themselves to philosophical and intellectual pursuits, which hopefully allow us to confront those temptations and passions. This would prevent them from falling prey to internal licentiousness and material greed. But not all men are strong enough to avoid that temptation. The result is the giving way to excessive power in the pursuit of wealth, which awakens the masses from their hedonistic stupor to demand action, either looking for the man of the people, if the cycle is swinging back to monarchy, or democratic revolution, if the cycle is swinging down toward a democracy. In the end, aristocracy has the best chance of being preserved in its simplest form, but temptation runs throughout all levels of its governance. 
This ultimately expires in unvirtuous aristocrats, the elite, essentially rigging the system for themselves. Again, we can see the resonance of Cicero's ideas in our own world today. This will eventually lead to a backlash, as it should, according to Cicero. The difference here is that temptation and descent into tyranny is the result of the corruption of a few who then begin to rig the political system to their benefit at the expense of the masses who have entrusted them to be fair, honest, and noble and realize that they're not. Cicero is telling us that no matter how virtuous, noble, and honorable best men are, they are constantly fighting temptation and the weak eventually prevail over those aristocrats who remain true to virtue and fairness. The few elites who remain virtuous and honorable are forgotten amid, among all of those elites and aristocrats who rig the system for themselves, who benefit only themselves, and therefore cause the ire of the people to move either into a democratic revolution or a Caesarian revolution to deal with the problems of aristocracy. Next, we look at the problem, the problems of a monarchy. The problem with monarchy is much like the others. A single ruler can always give in to his own temptations and become a tyrant. However, for Cicero, the more serious problem with monarchy is that you just never quite know how good the ruler is going to turn out to be. You can have a great king, like Cyrus of Persia, whom Cicero highlights as an example of a good king who exhibited all fatherly and just characteristics and virtues. But the moment the king begins to sink into tyranny, the aristocrats will jump him on the spot. It doesn't matter how virtuous he was. As soon as a king begins to rule unjustly, that kind of government vanishes on the spot for that same man has now become a tyrant. That is the worst king of government, and at the same time, the closest neighbor to the best, Cicero writes. This is Cer Cicero's paradoxical defense of monarchy. Even after the overthrow of monarchy by the aristocrats, it is somewhat like monarchy in being a paternal council of leading men who have their best interests of the people at heart if the tyrant has been killed or expelled by the people acting directly, the latter behave with reasonable restraint as long as they remain wise and sensible. However, the pushback toward monarchy usually ends with him becoming a tyrant. Tyrants always appear in political life. Even after throwing off monarchy for aristocracy or moving to democracy, the idea of filial affection and family togetherness remains ever-present in aristocratic and democratic governance. The common good never leaves us because we are social animals. However, monarchy is always a shot in the dark, so to speak. One never knows if they will have a good monarch and a just monarch, or if they will have a cruel, unvirtuous, and tyrannical monarch. Furthermore, just because you had a good monarch doesn't mean that his successor will be a good and just monarch. You can have a great king, but his son may be a terrible king when he inherits the throne. But then another irony is this, at least according to Cicero, better to suffer under a single tyrant than instead of a thousand tyrants. Nevertheless, there always remains a mystifying element to monarchy, even when we recognize its greatest flaws. We simply do not know if the monarch is going to be good and just. This is perhaps Cicero's most long-standing contribution to political philosophy, his bleak assessment of politics, the unruliness of the mob, uncontrollable passions, the danger of wealth in politics, the problems of an uneducated and unvirtuous citizenry and how it leads to chaos and tyranny, all of which come together in a tour de force, which produces youngsters who are ignorant wretches but think themselves as intelligent, older people who fear the young and attempt to court them over by prostituting themselves to their causes, from which all of this disorder invariably gives way to tyranny.
That said, Cicero does begin to offer us a pathway out of this problem, the study of philosophy from which virtue can emerge. Education, which comes from philosophy, is the only avenue of escape in Cicero's outlook. Philosophy is the pursuit of wisdom and the attempt to derive knowledge and from that knowledge, practical action in life. When we continue with Cicero, we will look directly at his claim that philosophy is the handmaiden of politics. However, in this most remarkable tour de force in his writings and thought, we see incredible insight for us today. Basically, democracy, according to Cicero, is good in theory because it steadfastly holds to the principles of liberty, equality, and merit. Aristocracy is good because it is the rule of moderation and virtuous men, which perpetuates long-standing stability and order, which we all enjoy. Monarchy is good because it is the most reflective of human nature, as we've mentioned, the want for beauty, affection, and attachment. However, the reality of politics is not some starry-eyed utopia. It is a brutal and gruesome cycle of revolutions that always exhausts itself in tyranny and nihilism. To confront this tyranny and nihilism, Cicero suggests, we must study philosophy. But after studying philosophy and cultivating virtue, the next question follows, how do we act? Basically, Cicero's political philosophy is one of virtuous responsibility. But we know, even as Cicero saw in his day, people would rather pretend to be intelligent or embrace sensual hedonism and nihilism instead of owning up to the weight of virtuous responsibility. Politics is not about passion. It is about virtue. Like Aristotle, Cicero is a virtue ethicist and a virtue political theorist, as we said in our conclusion of the first lecture on Cicero's Republic. The highest virtue that calls us into politics is how we successfully integrate egalitarian liberty and merit democracy, moderated order, stability, and compromise, aristocracy, and filial obligations, affections, and willingness to die for father and fatherland, monarchy, into a mixed constitution, and then remain virtuous enough to defend it. Perhaps it is a bridge too far, but Cicero remained true to his commitments to the very end of his life, being captured and executed for his opposition to Julius Caesar and Caesar's de facto heir in 43 BC, Mark Antony.